has done a tremendous job with his scholarship and with his passion as far as this moment is concerned. The Reverend Dr. James Harris is the professor of homiletics at the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology at the Virginia Union University. And I don't know about you, but I have been personally inspired by his passion, his zeal, his enthusiasm as he has shared this moment. So Hampton, would you put your hands together and welcome our second lecturer for this moment, the Reverend Dr. James Harris. Thank you so much, thank you, thank you so much. Good morning again, Hampton, and to all of you, to the esteemed president of uh, this conference, and uh, to uh, Reverend Deborah Hagens, and to the um, executive uh, board, those persons who are assembled here today, to each of you, thank you all so very much. Today, um, and I wanna thank, but before I begin, I want to thank those persons from Second Baptist Church as well who came down to here and to be a part of that. Uh, the chairman of our trustees, Brother Greg Turner, Deacon Mac Anderson. I see Bernie Anderson, also a deacon, also a deacon, uh, Margaret Barnes, and uh, Sister Mary Hicks. Thank you all for coming and sharing. My brother Douglas, I saw him up there in the um, in the audience along with um, his wife Gloria and um, certainly my wife Demetrius who has been here with us each day. Thank you so much. Today I continue this um, theme that I've been uh, sharing with you on getting in front of the text. Getting in front of the text. And so today, um, with that same understanding, I'm sharing with you also as a kind of surplus of meaning in terms of getting in front of the text, uh, the sermon from sermon to social action also being a way of moving in front of the text. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. One of my own mentors, Dr. Sam Proctor, said that preachers have to learn to live in eternity while being in the midst of time. And then uh, Howard Thurman, we are called upon to wrestle with a great idea. And that's our task today. My beloved brothers and sisters, the text in action, I want to say that the text is action, and action is or means to be propel propelled forward. So getting in front of the text means moving forward in a new and transformative way. This means further that at some point, sooner rather than later, the preacher has to move from the high and lofty elevation of the pulpit podium to the ground level of the street where the rubber hits the road, where the words of the scripture text and the sermon itself become embodied in the life and actions of the preacher and the people. The sermon is not simply a verbalized mental construct. The sermon is not an ordinary speech to be spoken or saying to be said and then forgotten, but the sermon must rise up from its repose on the page and create an action, a powerful transformative action. The sermon must always do something, that is the words of the sermon are compelled to engender in the preacher and in the hearer in the congregation a desire to do, a desire to act to become not just a hearer, but a doer of the word, an active participant in making the meaning of the word, God's word, come alive 
like a spark of fire or an electrical current that can shock the dying body and soul back to life. When this happens, my beloved, the action itself is not only the embodiment of the scripture text, but the action itself becomes a corollary text. This new text is representative of the word of God, that is the gospel in creative action. The gospel or gospel preaching is not meant to be limited to words or writing and speaking or preaching as speech, the spoken, but the logos is also an action, a sharp, bold, blatantly unforgettable action. It is the ultimate creative action, action, that is the action of the preacher and his or her words is now itself a text, not just the performance of the existing scripture text, but the new created text born out of struggle, born out of hope, born out of the power of the Holy Spirit, resulting in transformative social action. Not just concern for the poor, not just concern, but action on behalf of the poor and the oppressed. To be concerned is too passive, it is too distant. Jesus' words in Luke 4, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, suggest that the mysterious, magisterial, meaningful language and word is grounded in the power of the preached word and the power of the Holy Spirit which create and necessitate action. The sermon that doesn't leave the pulpit is a wanton and worthless wrangling of earthly words. It is, in fact, an affront to God and the Holy Spirit. It is the antithesis of sermonic discourse as our ancestors who could not even read or write because it was forbidden by law right here in Virginia. It was forbidden by law and custom. It was forbidden throughout the South. But they often said they'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. My beloved, the seeing of the sermon is the action of the sermon manifested in doing something like feeding the poor helping youth and young people graduate from high school and college, advocating for the elevation of poor and oppressed individuals, and seeking to transform the larger community, fighting against illiteracy, fighting against injustice, and fighting against the pipeline to prison that seems to engulf and incinerate the hopes and dreams of too many young black people. So today, my beloved, we must understand that getting in front of the text is an action that transforms. The scripture text which gives rise to thought and action is the driver of the sermon. It is not enough for the text to cause you to think, but the text must cause and compel us to act, to get up off of your assiduous, assumptive posterior, to get up off of your gluteus maximus and do something. The text, however, the problem of understanding and explaining a text is not solved by the so-called intentions of the author. The text often has an inherent plurivocity or multiplicity of meanings that are not arbitrary. There is a surplus of meaning in every text, not just what Aquinas or Luther or Calvin, and I dare say St. Augustine meant, Every interpretation ain't equal, which means that some interpretations are not only inferior to others, but some are negatively off the chain, and some are downright irrational, off base and wrong ethically, socially, spiritually, and otherwise. Some interpretations are socially and theologically inept, racially offensive and oppressive if they do not speak to the physical, spiritual, and social needs of the community especially those on the underside of culture. The text then, uh, that it, it is unfortunately too often used as a pretext for the preacher to say what he or she wants to say, apart from the meaning of the scripture text. This is a problem that I observe over and over again among students, among preachers and pastors. There has to be a commitment to the text that in many ways we have to understand that does not end in an adulterous promiscuity or what I call sermonic adultery or sermonic fornication. I think that the language of sexuality is appropriate here because it has a level of universality that the preacher and all elements of humanity can understand easily. 
mainly because it is inherently and grossly human, all too human, to use the language of the philosophers Friedrich Nietzsche and Hannah Arendt. The fact that there is or seems to be a proclivity, a strong tendency to choose a text and then abandon it for another text that may or, not, or may or may not be analogous to the chosen text appears to be inherent to the preacher's lack of commitment to textuality in sermon development. I'm saying to you today that this is problematic because it scatters the preacher's thoughts all over the place and undermines every element of the sermon. For example, once the preacher abandons the chosen text for another text in the middle of the sermon, this means in effect that the title of the sermon has also been abandoned by implication. The sermon's proposition has also been abandoned as well. Switching from John 3.16 to 1 Corinthians 13.12 changes the focus of the sermon from God's love of creation to creation's or humanity's lack of understanding the meaning of love as a revolutionary and tr transformative act. One text, the John 3.16 text, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that uh, text is theocentric to the core. God so loved the world that he gave his begotten son in 1 Corinthians. And then in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, that text is grounded in a weak and fallible anthropology that makes a mockery of both agapeic love and erotic love. So as a rule, you can't be jumping from text to text, from one text to another, just because they sound alike or just because they seem to be related or because it makes you look biblically literate and smart. What it does is that it makes you look and sound like somebody who doesn't know the difference between theology, Christology, and anthropology. In one text, Christ is the center, and in the other text, he is not. So we must come to understand, and we must uh, stay focused. These texts have their own integrity apart from each other. So stay focused on the chosen text and leave the other text alone until another day, another time, and another sermon. My beloved, it seems to me that one of the difficulties faced by the preacher is to learn how to carve and craft points or moves that David Buttrick describes from the chosen scripture text. Black people have always talked about points in black preaching, and that's a reality. The text, we, but we must focus on extrapolating these points or these moves from the chosen text. Notice now that I'm a bit Freudian, that is, ob obsessed and fixated on insisting that the sermon be textual and not topical. My philosophy is that you don't have to be much of a preacher to talk about topics. Though topical preaching has received lots of accolades and quite a large following, maybe for that very reason. But it is my contention that biblical, scriptural, textual preaching has a greater chance of being transformative if it is grounded in a scripture text and not in a topic that takes you from one text to another ad infinitum and often ad nauseum. You know what I'm talking about. T turn to John 3.16. Now, now let's turn to Revelation 6.1. Uh, now let's turn to Exodus 4.13. Uh, now, now let's turn back to Genesis 1.16. You are tossing and turning throughout the sermon, unable and unwilling to commit yourself to the development of the particular uniquely chosen text. My beloved, allow me to overstate the case in my own language. This is what I call over and over again textual abandonment. In fact, it is more than that. It is textual promiscuity. It is textual adultery. It is being completely unfaithful and uncommitted to the chosen text. It is, my beloved, a type of textual whoredom in search of unrequited pleasure. However fleeting, moving from text to text, like moving from sex to sex. 
no commitment, none of that. I'm calling on the preacher to focus on the text. Preachers are compelled to do the following few things to begin to advance the preaching process through commitment to the chosen text and to try to get in front of the text and not stay lagging behind it. This is what I suggest as a prelude to sermon point development. Now, my beloved, you have to start with a scripture text of your own choosing and choose from the lectionary text or develop your own system for choosing a scripture text from week to week, month to month, or year to year. That's the first step. And then you have to spend a lot of time, hours and days, reading and studying the language or the words of the chosen scripture text. You don't have to know Greek. You don't have to know Aramaic or Hebrew. You don't have to know German or French. By language, I mean the translated or even the untranslated text. Now, it's all right, it's wonderful if you know these things. But if you don't, they will not stop you from textual development. Translations are tricky and subjective, though naturally some are better than others, but all of them, in my view, must be approached with a healthy degree of, sus of suspicion, a hermeneutic of suspicion. I'm suspicious of all biblical texts, and yet I love them all. Study, learn, and seek to know the meaning of every word or phrase in the chosen scriptural text. If you're using a scripture text as the source of the sermon, then you as the preacher are bound by it and wedded to it and compelled to labor with it, to wrestle with it until you have some modicum of understanding of it, at least for today's sermon. Remember that you cannot explain any text that you do not understand. Understanding precedes explanation. So you have to spend a lot of time trying to understand the text and you can't understand it until you can read it. I'm so tired of seeing preacher after preacher bumbling and stumbling over the text. From the semantic autonomy of the text, that is, based upon your understanding of the meaning of the particular chosen text, then you come up with a sermon title that reflects your interpretation and your understanding of the text and what it is trying to say to you and your people given your social context. As you start, try to come up with not just one title, but five or six sermon titles that will be competing for the number one spot come Sunday morning. Write these titles down on a separate sheet of paper and put them aside for a day or so because coming up with the sermon title based on the text is not an easy task. And I'm saying to you today that your sermons need to stop coming from the sides of city buses. They need to stop coming from what you hear on the radio. They need to stop coming from popular songs and other kinds of things. What I'm saying to you today is that the sermon must be grounded in and based upon the scripture text. And then, my beloved, you should write the chosen text or pericope in the version you prefer and try to memorize it. Write it with your own hand as a way of making it resonate in your own heart and in your own soul. Then translate or interpret the text in your own language so you put it in your own words. At this point, it is necessary to understand other things such as the angle or the direction of the sermon, the main emphasis of the scripture text, auxiliary and ancillary foci of the text, what the text means to you and to your particular congregation today, or what you think it should mean given your particular social context. After working to extricate, to extrapolate, to pull as many titles as possible from the text, now you have to work to eliminate all the textually suggested titles except one. Every sermon needs only one sermon title. This one particular title should be the best of the list for now and should lend itself to clarity, to plain sense, to simplicity, 
and ease of understanding and ease of explanation. When the preacher finally mounts the pulpit, remember that as the preacher, you cannot explain again, and I reiterate, can't say it enough, you can't explain that which you cannot understand. A scripture text needs to be understood by the preacher first. And if you try to preach what you don't understand, you will only be fumbling, mumbling, tumbling, and bumbling along, doing a disservice to God, and doing a disservice to the people of God, and preaching the gospel by being unprepared and unfocused. Now, after working through the introduction, which should be tight and focused on the scripture text and the sermon title, which itself should be thoroughly textual, then the sermon can proceed to ask a question, sometimes we call it a relevant, meaningful, powerful, practical question that can be answered by the scripture text itself and your understanding and interpretation of that text. This question should be made obvious by the introduction of the sermon, which sets up the direction of the sermon. And you should not ask a question that the scripture text cannot answer because folk are seeking answers to practical issues and problems, not theoretical and hypothetical musings about things that don't matter to folk on the ground. At the, at, at the very moment you ask a question that is driven by something other than the scripture text, you've just set yourself up to travel down a road to destruction where your sermon will end up imploding and falling apart or morphing into something that you want to say apart from the integrity of the scripture text itself. Remember that it ain't about you in any ultimate sense. It's about the grace of God. It's about the love of God, which allows you as the preacher to get out in front of the text in order to transform the world. Now, the body of the sermon, or the point or points that the preacher has extrapolated from the text. Let me say unequivocally that the point or points of the sermon are determined by the scripture text and the adeptness and creativity of the preacher, not by another text. This means that there is no such thing as three points. This means that there's no such thing as three points unless the scripture text has in it three things that demand to be developed. If you try to develop three points out of a sermon, out of a text that doesn't have three points, then that's a perfect recipe for textual abandonment because you're gonna go looking for the third point in another text. You have to understand, my beloved, that there's nothing sacred about having three points. Nothing sacred about that. Nothing sacred about having three points when one point, two points, or four points are called for by the chosen text. So all I can recommend to you today is that the sermon, all sermons, should have at least, listen to me clearly now, all sermons should have at least one point. And it is better to have one well-developed and highly textual point than to try to manufacture three points out of a one-point scripture text which leads ineluctably to a pointless sermon that bounces to and fro all over the place. Now, my beloved, let me say a word about the architecture of a point. The architectonic, the architecture of a point is critical and this is rather theoretical. I want to say a word about the complex interplay between two modes of perception, what we call presentational immediacy and causal efficacy. Actually, this interplay is termed symbolic reference. In developing a point, you as the preacher should focus on the immediacy, the epidermal nature of the point. This means that presentational immediacy is that which presents itself on the surface in the text. It is what jumps out at you on a very visceral level as you read and extrapolate a point from the chosen text. This extrapolation may lack depth and sophistication, but it is enough to be characterized as a point that will need more development and more depth. This depth is what I'm calling causal efficacy. This is moving from scratching the surface or saying what is obvious to the average reader to digging for a deeper meaning, using all of your resources 
to help in the understanding and explanation of the point. This symbolic reference in the language of the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead is akin to Paul Ricoeur's ostensive reference in as much as they both point to a direction in front of the text that makes the scripture text come alive in the real lives of real people. When people testify that God healed them from a disease or God delivered them from an addiction, they mean this in a real way, not as a metaphor, but as a metonym, as a literal healing that transformed them from sickness to wellness, from weakness to strength, from faithfulness, from faithlessness to faithfulness. And when people talk about that, when they testify about it, they mean it in a real way. I know somebody here is a witness to that today. What God has done for you and how God has blessed you. Preaching strong, well-developed sermons that are tightly constructed is a difficult and continuous process that requires a broad understanding and love of people, knowledge of the biblical text, and the social and spiritual concerns and needs of the particular congregation. In addition to these basic requirements, there is the need to know why and what to do in order to put together a sermon that speaks to the heart and the soul of folk who come to church week after week in order to hear a word from the Lord via the preacher and the sermon. And they expect this sermon to change their lives. This is really a miracle and a mystery in an age of social, cultural, political, and technological change. In an age of Twitter, Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram. In an age of addiction to the cell phone and addiction to pleasure and feel-good desires, 24 hours a day, sustained and fueled by toxic substances that have become cravings like the fructose in everything we eat and the caffeine in everything we drink and the opioids we feed ourselves as if they were vitamin C or vitamin D. This is an awesome responsibility which none of us has been adequately prepared for. However, I endeavor to outline the process of sermon development and demonstrate that process and method to you as much as possible. I know that the preaching teacher does not have the luxury of being completely theoretical, such as some historians, philosophers, and theologians. I say this because the sermon itself is the best speaker and demonstrator of the spiritual and reasonable nature of the homiletical task. It must be your best work all the time. You cannot afford to be lackadaisical. You cannot afford to be half-hearted. You cannot afford to be half-witted. You have to put time into the development of the sermon like it is a full-time job. I say that because it is a life and death enterprise. People are counting on you. They are looking to you to make a difference in their lives. I don't have to tell you that preaching remains the heart and soul of the black church, as Cleo LaRue and Henry Mitchell have explained, and the metaphor of the sermon as a two-edged sword represents for me the value and importance of dialectical textual preaching. Preaching does, in fact, cut both ways, left and right. By this, I mean that the real and the ideal are brought together by this image of the sword with its two sharp, even serrated edges. One edge is construed as the thesis or the ideal as seen in the scripture text, and the other edge of the same sword is the antithesis or the real life situation. Together, in terms of preaching method, they constitute the introduction to the sermon, which is often grounded in negativity, but not absolutely. In simple dialectical terms, the real and the ideal are designed to create a tension mimicking that of the life we all live, where good and evil, right and wrong, justice and injustice, joy and sorrow, pain and pleasure, and love and hate have to be negotiated and mediated every day in the physical body and in the social community and in the social world. The book of James makes this clear when it asserts that out of the same mouth comes blessings and cursing. We also find in the book of Hebrews these words about the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow in Hebrews 4.12. The antithesis would postulate that according to the textual words above, we live in a word-infested world. These words in the real world 
in the tough and tumble of real life are not always alive and active nor sharp and encouraging and enlightening. They are not always exciting and enlivening, not always enriching and empowering, but sometimes they are dim and dull, empty and envious, encircling our experiences of joy with ugly expressions of enmity and evil and hate. The words that people use, the things that we say to others, and what is said to us and about us and by us can do good or harm. These words can build up or they can tear down. As a pastor and preaching teacher, I try lovingly to build up the preacher's confidence and efforts, but I'm not always understood because some stuff that the preacher puts uh, forth posing as a sermon is in fact mess and must be discouraged and disallowed with a carefully chosen act of words, words that can create hope and love or they can cause fear and despair. Some words are written, spoken, read, or heard are ugly, are plain, ugly, and mean. For example, as a preacher and homiletics teacher, I encourage you today to refrain from saying about another preacher such demeaning and derogatory words as this fellow preacher called by God cannot preach. Don't say that he can't preach or don't say that she can't preach. Think about it, what those words mean and think and about, think about how they are debilitating and destructive. Ask yourself saying, how did I become the judge of whether a person can or cannot preach? And what do you mean when you say such words? Are you talking about the architecture of the sermon? Or are you talking about the methodology used in the construction of the sermon? Are you talking about the lack of correlation between the scripture text? Are you talking about the sermon title? Are you talking about the language and logic of the sermon? Are you talking about the diachronic or synchronic message of the sermon? Or more likely, you are making a judgment about the preacher's style, about his antics and orality, or even the acoustics of the setting. Or is the language grounded in a statement about the preacher's personality, his demeanor or her demeanor, reading or speaking ability. We have to know and understand what we mean when we say something about any subject, especially the sermon and the preacher. So I admonish you today and I encourage you not to say today that so-and-so cannot preach. Oh, certainly, for sure, some particular cases, this may be justifiable. However, to make such a judgmental statement is to show your own own limitations alongside the shortcomings of another preacher. If your understanding and view of preaching uh, and, and, and view of preaching that assert that assertion may be true, and yet I advise you not to say it to or about your fellow preachers, to keep it to yourself and allow others to come up with their own conclusions because preaching is not a competition, preaching is not a song, and it is not a dance. Oh, it's not a carnival and it's not a circus show. And what you are saying anyway, when you say that Reverend sister or brother so-and-so can't preach, what are you saying? Think about what that language means. In a certain sense, it can be an indictment of the self and it distances you from another preacher in a way that is psychologically and spiritually arrogant and just plain ugly. And certainly, you don't think of yourself that way as a teacher, as a coach, as a mentor of preachers and as a pastor for many years, my calling, my responsibility as a preacher and to preachers is to do the best I can to constantly prepare myself and to become a better teacher and preacher and to help others who are struggling to prepare and enrich themselves. That's my task, not to tear somebody down. Preaching and teaching preaching is an awesome act of love for me and can only be done out of love. Yes, yes, there are folk who have not made great, a great grades on their sermons in my classes, yes, but I don't go out and say they can't preach because who am I to say that? The very next time they preach, they may preach the roof off the place because God's grace is a part of all preaching and we should not with that kind of ad hominem go out talking about one another. I thought I might say that today. And let me add, if you, if you are preaching to people and you don't love people, yeah. 
The preacher mentioned it this morning. Some of us have gotten so big we can't shake hands with people. Surrounded by so many people. But if you are preaching to people and you don't love people, then I came to say today that you are a joker. You are a fraud in danger of bringing hellfire and damnation upon yourself. And if we judge prematurely other preachers as can't, pre pre can't preach preachers, we are setting ourselves up as little judging gods when the truth is that we have no right and no authority to judge. Listen up, my beloved. Just because you may be popular as a preacher, just because you might be surrounded by thousands of people on Sunday morning, and just because folk are telling you that you are a great preacher, folk are stroking your ego and patting you on the back with accolades, and folk are giving you money and satiating your senses and bowing down at your feet, I'm here to say today that this doesn't mean that you are in fact a great preacher. I want to establish the fact that there is a qualitative difference between greatness and popularity. Think about it. I know it's hard to face, but you may have crowds and throngs of listeners and parishioners, and it might be not because you are saying something great and transformative, but it could be that you ain't saying nothing to challenge folk, nothing to help them take a serious look at transforming their lives much less transforming the community and transforming the world. Follow me closely now. Jesus is preaching and teaching led to what? Led to death on a cross, not popularity. Jesus is preaching and teaching led to unpopularity. Unpopularity to me is more Christological and more theological than popularity. And preachers have no interest in saying that which will lead to social and political revolution, ultimately death. In the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus preached, the Pharisees and the scribes covered up their ears and began immediately plotting to kill him. Everybody wants to hear us. Everybody wants to throng to hear us. Maybe just because what we are saying does not trouble anybody. The sermon makes folk feel good, but it don't do them no good, except satiate their egos. The gifted preacher, if you are that, is not always the great preacher, and the so-called great preacher may not be gifted with much truth or holiness at all. Personality, yes. Style, yes. Melodic voice, yes. Charisma, yes. Handsome, and in the language of Muhammad Ali, pretty, yes. Adorned with beauty, yes. But what about love? What about justice? What about truth? What about possessing what St. Augustine, the fourth century North African bishop, called the sweetness of the word in your everyday life? Jesus says that he that is the greatest among you shall be your servant. This word, this declaration of Jesus in Matthew's gospel clashes with our own being waited on hand and foot as pastors and bishops seeking to be served rather than serving, serving others. Listen, my beloved, I tell you the truth. I've never been considered a great preacher and not too popular either. even in my own church and in my own community. And that's all right, because to me, that's the spirit of Isaiah. It's the spirit of Amos. It's the spirit of Christ Jesus. Yes, we need to understand that I have to study hard and I have to work hard I have to pray hard just to survive among these entertaining, popular culture, soundbite, telegenic, histrionic purveyors of celebrity and popularity. But I tell you what, I may not be popular, and I'm surely not great, 
But the important thing for me is that I don't want to ever be accused of not studying and not preparing in a way that advances black life or human life for that matter. So it is in the spirit of the ancient rabbis that I seek to be holy by believing that the preacher who reads and studies is participating in an act of holiness. Studying is an act of holiness and righteousness for me. The preacher has to develop the whole self, not just prayer and fasting, it's not just the voice, it ain't just the hoop, it's not just the laughter, it's not just the cadence, it's not just the syncopation, but it's also the mind, the brain, which has both a left side and a right side, a cognitive and an emotional side. Preaching demands the development of the plasticity of the brain in all of its dimensions. All of this helps the preacher to get in front of the text. Get in front of your own ego by leaving it behind. And this should help the preacher to get in front of the text. Get the self out of the way first. And then maybe God and the Holy Spirit will allow you to get out in front of the text by sublimating the destructive egoistic self and elevating the word of God such that the grace of God can open up the text in new and transforming ways. No matter how much we study or how much we know, we still need the grace of God in preaching. God has to step in and make us what God wants us to be. I'm telling you, it is the power of God that enables us to do what we need to do. Listen up. One autumn evening, just a few months into the job, a large group of folk, unruly and boisterous, contentious and ready to fight, had summoned me to a meeting to explain what they disliked about me and why my leadership style so much uh, was not conducive to what they expected. And I should not bother even to come to church because they were in control of the worship and my very presence was a hindrance to their worship experience and spiritual celebration. My name had been derided in the public square and all other possible places, but it was under this palpable pressure I struggled to maintain my sanity and to preach the word of God. But it was more than a notion, more than a bur more of a burden than a blessing. This was a storm, and even the folk who were in my corner, those who voted to call me to serve as pastor, were having second thoughts and plotting to help form a coup. I was caught in the vortex of a whirlwind, in the center of a brewing storm, where there was little to no peace in my soul. Preaching through a storm is a terrible burden that I don't wish on anyone. I want to preach, but I could barely get out of bed, and it was even more difficult to attend the church where I was the pastor. I was sinking into a deep depression, both spiritual and physical and it took every fiber in my body and soul to fight against its destructive forces I lost my appetite I lost weight I lost my hair nihilism was tra was trying to take hold of me but I did not lose hope because my faith uh, miraculously grew stronger and like in the gospel of Mark where people were saying that Jesus was a demon well they said the same of me and they and the, they added the addendum that I couldn't preach even some of my students and interns bought into this most judgmental subjective and politically destructive narrative it is often a fictive narrative intended to be the death knell of the preacher for the people to say that the black preacher can't preach is like saying that the doctor or the physician can't heal or can't be a doctor. It is the antithesis of being what one is claim, claims to being. No, it is more damning than that. It is, in fact, an attempted ontological negation. It is a castration that applies only to the black preacher, where the standard is grounded in the performative. Folk, black folks sit in and listen to Joel Osteen. They sit and listen to John Hagee. They sit and listen to everybody else under the sun. But when it comes to the black preacher, every judgment becomes something different. And they are quick to say, I want to say to you today, I ain't never heard Joel Osteen preach a sermon. He got more black people listening to me than I do. I'm not going to say he can't preach because I don't say that. But a sermon, no. Something to make folk feel good, yes.
To say that is an affront to being, which is not limited to the self, but extends to God. In other words, to say that the black preacher can't preach is to say that you question the wisdom of God in calling such a non-performing person. It is to say that God can't possibly be God to make a preacher so ungifted and black. It is to say that you are the judge of God's faulty judgments and that God has been mistaken in bestowing on that particular black preacher, whoever he or she is, the call to preach. It is to completely ignore the anthropological dilemma of the weak and frail preacher. And in a a serious way it is to drive the nails of crucifixion into Jesus all over again by asserting that God's chosen black representative of Christ can't preach. It is to say that the preacher is not a treasure in an earthen vessel but a trinket in an earthen vessel. A treasure, no. A golden coin, no. A pot of silver, no. A wonderful mouthpiece of God, no. A blessing from God to the people of God, no. To say that the preacher can't preach is to make the preacher an automaton and to make the creative, powerful word of God a fruitless product of material culture, like an assembly line of auto parts or body parts like dry bones. But in spite of the negative, ugly, and evil, evil words, we have to get up, we have to go ahead, brush your shoulders off, go back to the study, sit at the desk, and pray that God and the muse will inspire you to work harder and to honor that which you have been called to do. Somebody may have heard you on your worst day when the burdens of your life were so heavy upon your heart and your soul that you in fact do, did do a disservice to preaching the gospel. On that day and at that time and place, yes, you or I may have been guilty of not doing what God called us to do. The preacher couldn't preach. Preaching is always hard and demands a dedicated and determined desire to do justice to the call to which you have been called. If you can open up your mouth, I say to you today, yes, you can preach. I don't care what folks say about you. If you can open up your mouth, if you can read, yes, you can preach. Yes, if you can study, yes, you can preach. If you can pray, then yes, you can preach. If it, it, it may not be with eloquent words of wisdom, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 4. It may not be like Jorena Lee. It may not be like Dwight Riddick. It may not be like James Perkins. It may not be like Charles Booth. It may not be like Jeff Guns. It may not be like Martin Luther King or Sam Proctor or Ella Mitchell. It may not be like Amen Flowers or Jeff Downing. It may not be like Drew Ross or Antonio Red or Stephen Blunt. It may not be like Bishop Liston Page. It may not be be like William Curtis or William Johnson. It may not be like Joy Carter Minor or Marcus Allen. It may not be like anybody in your family or in your church or in your seminary class. But if God called you to preach, don't let anybody, don't let any words shut you down. Our words to and about one another are often harmful and hurtful. They are sometimes jagged and jeering and jarring. They can be little or they can build up. I can say to you today, learn to build up one another by telling the truth in love and kindness, thereby encouraging one another in the spirit of Christ. That should be our hope. That should be our determination. And that should be what we are seeking to do, recognizing that it is love that builds us up. The word of God, the time-honored word of God, and Paul writes, or we find in 1 Corinthians about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know, but the man who loves God is known by God. The man or the woman who knows God is, is loved by God. You need to recognize, yes, that knowledge indeed puffs up, but love builds up. Paul is not an enemy of knowledge because there is some goodness in knowledge. Knowledge itself is not the enemy, but knowledge like anything else. Knowledge, my beloved brothers and sisters, like food sacrificed to idols, for example, can lead to idolatrous, idolat idolatrous behavior. Paul is no enemy of knowledge, but knowledge devoid of faith is a type of idolatrous egoism. Knowledge devoid of love is a vile destructive force capable of emasculating, destroying, and annihilating anything that crosses its path to power and domination. This is the same vaunted knowledge, the same boastful knowledge, 
in the same vain knowledge that allows our leaders to smirk and smile while talking about American democracy, and at the same time dominating powerless people. We know that we all possess knowledge, Paul says. He is suggesting that this is not something to boast about. Yes, we all have knowledge, but to boast about it ain't necessary. To boast about our knowledge is no virtue. And by the way, Paul is not complimenting the Corinthians. This is more of an indictment than anything else. Knowledge rightly understood as a gift from God is not something for us to boast about because when we boast about our own knowledge, as if it were our own. All we do is proclaiming our own ignorance. There is an irony here. The more you boast in the spirit and language of my own father, the more you boast, the more ignorant you sound. And we all have to be careful because a little knowledge is even more dangerous than a lot. Paul, like many of us gathered here today, is no enemy of knowledge. God forbid, black people need all the knowledge we can get, but it's like power. You give some people a little authority, and before you know it, it's done gone to their heads. And you wonder, what in the world happened to him or her? How did their heads swell so big so fast? Because the more you know, the more you understand your limitations and your finitude and the more you should understand the infinite knowledge and love and goodness of God. Yes, my beloved brothers and sisters, don't hate, don't be mad with somebody who doesn't seem as capable as you are. We should learn, we should read, we should study hard, we should stay in the library, we should burn the midnight oil, but don't forget that it's not knowledge that calms your fears and curtails your cravings. It's not knowledge that makes you say I'm sorry or pardon me. It's not knowledge that woke you up this morning and enables you to keep on keeping on. No, it's not knowledge. It's not knowledge. A lot of us have a lot of knowledge. Gnosis, a lot of us have a lot of knowledge. It's not knowledge that provides freedom and liberation because Paul says now about food sacrificed to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. There's knowledge all over America. There's knowledge all over the world, but there still ain't no peace. There's knowledge everywhere we look and everywhere we turn. We still got discord. There's knowledge in families and among among friends, there are folk with PhDs and folk with master's degrees, and we still don't know how to get along with one another. Knowledge puffs up. I want to build up people who have been beaten down. I want to build up folk who've been talked about, folk who've been discouraged. Knowledge puffs up, it swells the ego. Knowledge focuses on the self, creating a negative and false pride. Knowledge puffs up, it inflates, it makes haughty and arrogant. It makes one falsely think too highly of oneself. This is head knowledge that is not made an axis through the heart and through the soul. This knowledge that puffs up is knowledge that has not made the journey through experience, the journey through trouble, the journey through hard times, the journey through sorrow and suffering. This is head knowledge that has not traveled the long winding road of headaches and the curvaceous and slippery slope of pain and despair and dejection. This head knowledge puffs up and make us walk around like we have some type of power over other folk. Indeed, often showing contempt towards one another. This is puffed up knowledge. But wait, my beloved, preacher of the word, some eloquent, some not so eloquent, some with big churches, some with storefronts. Here is the thesis. I'm here to tell you today that love builds up in Christian ethics and theology, in Christian practice, knowledge must always lead to love, not puffed up pride. Love builds up, love edifies, love builds up character, love builds up respect, love creates justice, love builds up strength, love helps other folk, love does good for others. As a matter of fact, love is centered in others, not in the self. It seeks to make others happy. Love builds up the church. Love builds up the community. Love builds up the family. Love builds up the school. Love builds up the marriage. Love builds up the children. Love builds up behavior. Love builds up the attitude. Love builds up our disposition. We need to be more of a loving people rather than like crabs in a barrel pulling each other down. Love I'm here to declare to you today is true knowledge. Love is true understanding. Love is the seat of power. Love is the father of hope and the offspring of godly desire. 
when you build up those who have been beaten and torn down by the winds of indifference and the torrents of terror that have torn apart their hopes and dreams. That's true knowledge. That's love. True knowledge and true love are bound together. They are married to each other with compassion and with understanding. When you build up the self-esteem of your children and when you help adults achieve their goals and potentials, that's love. When you build up your character so that you treat the poor with respect and love, so that you give your time to help somebody along the way, that's love. Paul made it even clearer a few chapters later when he wrote, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Love seeks not its own. If you're here today trying to advance yourself, seeking something for yourself, that's the meaning of egoism. It is not the meaning of love. Love seeks not its own. Love is always concerned about the other. Love is patient, it is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in truth. Love never fails, prophecies will cease, tongues will fail, knowledge, it will pass away. These three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Love has the power to lift us up out of the dire and out of the rough and miry clay. Love has the power to lift us up and to take us to a brand new level. Love has the power to shake us up and turn us around. Love has the power to bring us from the depths of depression and put us to the highest heights of preaching. I tell you, if you want to be a preacher today, you got to preach out of love. You got to love our people. You got to love our folk. You got to love what God has put in your life and what God has done for you. Yes, if you are a preacher today, you have to be able to join the, sand, song, the songwriter saying, I was seeking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within. All of us, no matter who we are, we are not so great, we are not so this and so that, very deeply stained with sin, seeking to rise no more. But, 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 what does the song say? But, but, but the master of the sea. You know who the master is. The master of the sea. This ain't Leviathan. It is the master of the sea. Jesus, the joy of my salvation. Jesus, the one who broke us up, the one who strengthens us from day to day. The master of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. I can run on a little while longer. I can keep on keeping on because I know that love lifted me. I ain't preaching now. I'm lecturing. But I know that love lifted me. I know that love lifted me when nothing else could help. Nothing else could help. No education. No PhD. No church. No money. No this or that when nothing else could help. When I couldn't sleep, when folk talked about me and called me everything but a child of God, love 